أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وهو خير ناصر ومعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد My respected elders, my dearest youngsters, brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum jami'a wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This lecture is a continuation of the lecture that we delivered yesterday, in which we were talking about the month of Muharram, and we were pointing out how this is a very opportune moment to be discussing and talking about our visioning as far as the end goal of all our efforts and all our struggles is concerned when it comes to promoting the correct teachings of Islam and the authentic teachings of the Quran and Ahlul Bayt والسلام, what is the end goal what is the final vision what is the final destination if you like and what's the end result and outcome that we are struggling and striving to achieve both for ourselves and for all those whom we want to benefit with this humble initiative of uh, delivering these lectures at Al-Islah. And so I mentioned to you from my own personal experience and my personal journey that when I look at my own life <clears throat> and the vision that I have set for myself and that I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant me steadfastness and tawfiq to remain firm on and what we really desire for the entire Ummah and the whole of humanity, if possible, is for all of us to achieve the vision that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has outlined in Surah Fussilat, verses 41, uh, Surah 41, verses 30 to 32, where he talks about this group of people who will be treated to an amazing VIP reception the moment the test of the life of this world is over. And who are these people? Allah identifies them with two prominent and preeminent conspicuous qualities. Two conditions. They satisfy and because of it Allah gives them this honor. Number one, in الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ Indeed, those who say our Rabb, our sustainer, our nurturer, our nourisher, our Rabb is Allah. Thumma staqamu. It is not enough to say this with your mouth. You have to thumma staqamu. Istiqama refers to steadfastness and perseverance. Meaning Allah is showing you that after you say your Rabb is Allah, you won't just be left alone. You will be tested. You will be tempted. And shaitan will try to place various traps to deviate and to divert you and pull you away from this declaration and this recognition. And if you look at shaitan's track record, he has succeeded so many times in the past. And so this is what gives him the confidence to continue the work he's doing in the present and to keep doing it in the future. You find as far as the rububiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying that Allah is our Rabb, every theist who, who is a believer in God, and by the way, even the polytheists, many of the polytheists, even they accept and acknowledge the rububiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani as far as saying with your mouth that Rabbun Allah, our sustainer and our Lord is God, is Allah, this is something Allah shows you in the Quran. Even the kuffar and mushrikeen of Mecca were not averse to, they were not hostile to this idea. You can see this from very clearly throughout the Quran. Let me just give you as a sample that you can go and check for yourself. Surah Al Mu'minun, Surah 23 of the Quran. Look at verses 84 to 92. There, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet. He says, He instructs him to ask the kuffar and mushrikeen. قُلْ لِمَنِ الْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهَا إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ O Prophet asked them, To whom does this earth and everyone on it belong? Whose is this? Whose property is this entire planet earth 
and everything on it, whose is it? Allah says, Sayaquluna lillah. They will say, it is Allah's. Oh, so even the kuffar and mushrikeen acknowledge Allah's right and divinity and sovereignty over planet Earth. They don't have hostility or they don't, they don't have an issue against this. Then Allah says, okay, further ask them, قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ السَّبْعِ وَرَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ O Prophet asked them, who is the Rabb, who is the sustainer of all the seven heavens? By heavens here, he means universe, huh? because from Suratul Mulk, you would know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about our universe, what does he say? He says, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِحَ When he talks about the stars, the stars that you see at night in the sky, they are part of our universe, they are part of the observable universe. They're not from some other universe, right? And Allah is saying these stars that you see at night, We have decorated and beautified the lowest heaven with, with bimasabiha, which means with lamps. Allah refers to the stars metaphorically as lamps because of their function. They are like lighting for the, for the night sky. So from this you deduce that this universe is the lowest of the multiverses out there. In any case, Allah is saying, ask these people, قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ السَّبْعِ This lowest heaven is just our universe. Beyond this universe, there are other universes. And Allah is asking the Prophet to ask the Kuffar, Mushrikeen of Mecca, these people whom the Quran projects as hell-bound, huh? people of hell, Allah but look at their aqidah, look at their belief system. You as a Muslim should be troubled when you when you read about this. The people who believe in God and accept his rububiyah can actually end up in hell. Yes, because summa staqamu is not there. You say with your mouth, but then you your actions falsify. Your practice falsifies your belief. That's the problem with the kufar and mushkinu makkah. So next verse, Allah says, قُلْ مَنْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ السَّبْعِ O Prophet asked them, who is the sustainer of all the seven heavens? Who is the sustainer and the Lord of the mighty great throne? Who? Sayaquluna lillah. Before even they can answer, Allah says, let me answer on their behalf. I know what their answer will be. Their answer will be, Sayaquluna lillah. They will say, it is Allah. So then have you no fear of him? You're defying him. You are going against his vision, these kuffar and mushrikeen of Makkah, despite accepting Allah, his uluhiyah, his rububiyah, they're still going against his vision. So Allah is saying, Afalat at Will you then not fear? Next verse, Qul man biyadihi malakutu kulli shayin, wa huwa yujiru wa la yujaru alayhi in kuntum ta'lamun. Ask them, O oh Prophet, to whom belongs the kingdom of everything? Who is the king of everything? Everything is his kingdom. Everything that exists is part of his kingdom. There's no escape from his kingdom. There's no possibility of escape from, from his kingdom and from his territory because everything comes under his kingdom. Who has the kingdom of everything in his hands? Who is the one Allah is asking who offers protection? Who offers protection to everything that needs protection? But he himself is in need of no protection. He doesn't need anyone to protect him from any threat because their aslan doesn't exist any threat against his sovereignty and his majesty. So Allah says, Tell me. Again, the answer is, Sayyidina. They will say, yes, all of this belongs to Allah. So Allah says, قُلْ تُسْحَرُونَ So then where is the magic? Because they were claiming the Holy Prophet is the magician. So then who is doing magic on you? The facts of the case, you recognize yourself. The problem is in the conclusions. So you might say, so Sayyidina, can you? Okay, this is all sounding very weird. We thought the Kufar and Mushrikeen, a lot of our children, our kids think Kufar and Mushrikeen of Makkah, enemies of the Prophet, were atheists. They didn't believe in Allah. No. They were like us in the sense that they did believe in Allah. 
They did say in a, they were among those who said Palu Rabbunallah when they were cornered, huh? In theory, just like you corner in, um, even today, you go to any theist, even polytheists, Maulana. We have plenty of them who are accessible to us. We go to them, we ask them. I can refer you to books that they have written, okay? Where they they, they mention these things very clearly. Uh, this is a book why. Answers to questions that have always baffled you by Ashok Swai, uh, by Ashok Swaini. Okay, he's a writer, and look at what he says on page two hundred and one of this book. He's trying to explain by whatever name he writes on page two hundred and one. By whatever name you address God, He is one. This is Ashok Swaini. Okay, by whatever name you address God, he is one. Lord, Lord Krishna has said the same thing in the Bhagavad Gita. And then he goes on to say that God instills reverence in the hearts of his followers according to the reverence with which they remember him. Actually, he then writes, according to me, there are only two religions in the world. Number one, theist or those who believe in God. And number two, atheist or those who do not believe in God. And who, which category does he himself and the religion that he is describing, to which category does it belong? He says, we are theists. We believe in God and we believe that he is one. So the oneness of God, Tawheed, is a universally recognized fact. Even the Kuffar and Mushrikeen of Mecca did not have f a fundamental issue with, with Tawheed. Yani they accepted it at some level. When they were cornered, when they were confronted, they accepted it. So you say, Sayyidina, so then where, what is the problem? Because there has to be a problem. Why? If Tawheed was something so well acknowledged and universally accepted, then why was the battle of Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Khaybar, all of these battles, why were they fought? Why was there so much, you know, Kekli Dhamalati after the Prophet came? Why? Doesn't make sense. No, it makes sense. When you read Surah number 12 of the Quran, Surah Yusuf, verse 106. This is the critical point that the Quran was trying to drive home and because of which there was conflict of ideology. Which is what? In verse 106 of Surah Yusuf, Surah 12, Allah says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Allah says majority of them, most of them, do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that they also do shirk with him. Problem is not in Iman. Problem is that after having an Iman in Allah, after accepting his uluhiyah, after accepting his rububiyah, after accepting his hakimiyah, after accepting everything about him, Problem begins where? Illahum mushrikun. Shirk is introduced by shaitan into the belief system. And we mentioned before, shirk cannot exist unless there is an underlying belief in God. An atheist cannot be a mushrik in the true sense of shirk because he doesn't believe in God. And when you don't believe in God, who are you going to associate? You don't have someone to associate with. For shirk, you need an, you need an Allah that you can set up equals and rivals and associates with. If you don't believe in Allah, the underlying belief of Allah is non-existent, then shirk cannot exist. Kufr can exist, yes. So atheism is a form of kufr. But Allah in the Quran and the, the, the war between the Prophet was not with atheists, it was with kufar and mushkin of Makkah who were firm believers in Allah. But the problem was that they were doing Shirk, they were following in, falling into shirk. So my dear brothers and sisters, that is why Allah is very, very keen in the Quran to get this point across. That's why when he talks about final salvation, whether it be in the verses of Surah Fussilat, or whether it be in the verses of Surah Al-Ahqaf, verses 13 and 14, he never says, in the ladina qalu rabbun Allah, you just say Allah is my Rabb or my Rabb is Allah and at the time of your death I will give you that VIP treatment that we talked about in the previous lecture that angels will descend upon you give you glad tidings of Jannah and tell you you have nothing to fear and nothing to grieve 
We are your awliya and your friends in the life of this world and in the hereafter. And there you shall have everything that you desire and everything that you demand. All of it as hospitality from an ever forgiving and extremely, extraordinarily merciful Lord. This has been promised to whom? To, to those who just say, our Rabb is Allah. End of story. No, Allah says, saying Allah is our Rabb or our Rabb is Allah is very easy. Everyone is saying this. The polytheists, when they are confronted, they also say this. When Allah says, قُلْ مَا رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ السَّبَعِ وَرَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمِ سَيَقُولُونَ لِلَّهِ Ask the Kufar and Mushikin of Makkah, who is the Rabb? Who is the sustainer of all the seven universes or seven heavens, multiverses? And the Lord of the mighty throne, who is the one who deserves these attributes of Rububiya, of the heavens and the earth? They will say, Sayyakuluna Lillah. They will say, It is Allah. So Allah is saying the problem is after acknowledging that it is Allah, when it comes to practice, who are they supplicating to? Who are they taking? as guardians and protectors. This is the problem that Allah identifies, my dear brothers and sisters. If you want to get a clear picture of this, please visit Surah Al-Ra'd. Go to Surah Al-Ra'd, Surah number 13 of the Quran, verse 16. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming for the, for the home run now. Because we need to, it's, it's pointless to discuss Kufar and Mushrikeen and other when we have a, a problem brewing inside our own house. So we're coming to that. But understand Surah Al-Ra'ad, Surah 16, sorry, Surah 13, verse 16 first. Here again, Allah asks the Holy Prophet to issue this interrog interrogatory question, which is, قُلْ مَرْ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ O Prophet, say, ask, who is the Rabb, who is the sustainer of the heavens and the earth? And then before anyone can answer, Allah says, قُلِ اللَّهِ You give the answer. This time Allah is asking the Prophet to give the answer. Qulillah, say it is Allah. Now, after registering and after affirming and asserting that it is Allah, look at what he says after that. After that, he addresses the Kuffar and Mushkin of Mecca and he says, Qul afattakhaltum min dunihi awliya'a la yamlikuna li anfusihim naf'an wa la darra. Allah says, my problem with you people and the reason why I am upset and displeased and dissatisfied with you is because min dunihi awliya. Yes, I know you accept me as your God. You even accept me as your Rabb. You acknowledge my uluhiyah. You acknowledge my rububiyah. Problem is where? Problem is min dunihi awliya. You have taken awliya. You have taken guardians and protectors besides me. Mindunihi means who are lesser than me. Yes, because the Kufar and Mushrikeen never ever claimed that their gods, the gods that they were worshipping, that they are equal to Allah or that they are greater than Allah. Oh, that would be blasphemy even for them. They used to say, as you see them saying in the opening verses of Surah Zuma, Allah quotes them, Surah 39. Look at the opening verses, 2 3. Allah says, these mushrikeen who take others as awliya, as guardians and protectors. You see, Allah wants, Allah says in the Quran, He is the wali. So understand, there is wilaya, there is one type of wilaya that is reserved for Allah, which no creation deserves. And that is the wilaya of protection and guardianship from across ghaib. Yani taking care of your affairs and offering you protection from difficulties, from calamities, from misfortunes, giving you sustenance, providing you with support, with help, with relief of, in difficulty. This is all under the wilaya of Allah. And Allah doesn't share this wilaya with any of his creations. Unfortunately, the ghulat and especially the mufawwida, who are the super specialists of this, you know, of engineering a wilaya of this sort, of this sort for the Ahlul Bayt. They were called mufawwida because they believed in tafwid, which means delegation of divine powers of creation and sustenance and re regulating the affairs of the universe to the Prophet and Imams of Ahlul Bayt. So in any case, Allah's problem with the Kuffar and Mushrikeen of Makkah is he's saying, min dunihi awliya. These people have taken awliya besides me. But notice how today 
when Imams of Ahlul Bayt, for example, or Sufi saints are taken as awliya besides Allah, the argument that is always made to justify this is what? That no, no, we don't believe that the, these awliya are na'udhu billah, na'udhu billah, God forbid, equal to Allah or associates with Allah or partners with Allah. No, 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 no. We don't believe in any of that. We simply believe that Allah has empowered them. Allah has given them qudra, iqdar. Okay. And they are not independent. They are fully dependent on Allah. Mawlana, this was the same aqidah of the kuffar and mushikin of Makkah. The proof is in the opening verses of Surah Al-Zumar. Do they believe that their false gods are equal to Allah or greater than Allah, na'udhu billah, or the same level as Allah? No. Look at their statement. When they justify their shirk, how do they justify it? Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَا إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى They say those whom, Allah says, those who they, whom they have taken as awliya, as guardians and protectors across ghayb, other than and lesser than Allah, when they are confronted, they say, we do not show worship-like devotion to these entities we don't show devotion to them except so that they may bring us closer to Allah with a greater degree of proximity. We're doing this, and they were worshipping idols, they're trying to come closer to Allah. And when you try to come closer to Allah, when you believe He is the most supreme Lord, right? They're essentially. These kuffar and mushkin of Makkah, their argument was that worshipping these idols and supplicating to them and seeking their intercession, these, this is all a means of coming closer to Allah and gaining favor with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because these idols, and these idols obviously, they didn't believe in those stones. Huh? The stones represent the atma, the, the spirit behind those idols is what they had in mind. So these if you go deep into the, the Fasid literature, you will see that a lot of these idols were actually uh, replicas or they were meant to be symbolic reminders of pious prophets of the past, pious personalities of the past. And so their mind was not so much focused on the stones that these idols were made of, but rather the spirit that animates and embodies that idol. And so... These kuffar and mushkin of Makkah would say that we're worshipping and showing devotion to these idols. Tawassulan, so that this is our tawassul, this is our way of coming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, look, I will judge between you on the day of judgment. Allah does not guide man huwa kathibun kafar. Allah does not guide liars. Because this whole claim of yours, that these idols are going to intercede for you or bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah does not accept it. He does not recognize it. He does not legitimize it. And that's why there is no sultan for it. So in any case, in, in verse 16, coming back to verse 16 of Surah 13, Allah says, قُلْ أَفَتَّخَذْتُمْ مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ Or, أَفَتَّخَذْتُمْ, sorry, أَفَتَّخَذْتُمْ مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ لَا يَمْلِكُونَ لِأَنفُسِهِمْ نَفْعًا وَلَا ضَرًا Say, have you taken besides Allah and lesser than Allah, awliya, guardians and protectors who do not control any benefit or harm for, their, for, for themselves. So Allah's problem is with these people, his issue, main issue with these kuffar and mushkin of Makkah is that they have taken awliya besides Allah who do not control any benefit or any harm. Now you might say, Mawlana, but this is about idols. And, and we can all accept that idols do not control any benefit and harm. How does this relate to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt? And what is happening within the framework of Shiaism or within the framework of Sufism, for example? Mawlana, the answer is in the teachings of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. You know what Allah says about the, the, the false deities of the Kuffar and Mushikin of Mecca and their idols? The Imams of Ahlul Bayt use the exact same words for themselves. And these are Quran verified narrations because the Quranic basis is in Surah Al Jinn. The Holy Prophet. Wasallam, so it's not like the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were the first to say this. Their grandfather already said it. Allah made him say it in the Quran. Qul in Surah Al Jinn. Qul inni la amliku li nafsi. 
wala rashada o prophet tell them very clearly very honestly and plainly tell them i do not control any harm or any good any guidance i have no control over these things so you see the problem that has happened in ghulu and under the influence of ghulu is people have forgotten their role the ghulat wanted to give divine role to the prophets and imams to say that imams and prophets they come into this world so that they may perform the functions of allah on behalf of allah with his permission the mufawwida especially were very particular in stressing that allah is the one who has given the permission and the imams cursed them they said you are lying against allah allah never gave us this permission if he had given us this permission we would be the first to tell you and inform you because the things that allah has blessed us with we don't hide them from you do we allah blessed imams of ahlul bayt with immense hikmah and knowledge did they ever hide their knowledge did they ever hide their hikmah from people and say no 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 we don't have anything go away go away no whenever people came to them imam ja'far as-sadiq alayhi salam whether the mainstream muslims came to him when the ahlus sunnah followers of imam malik would come to him followers of abu hanifa would come to him he would give them guidance when zaidis came to him he gave them guidance when his own followers came to him he everyone who comes to him is giving guidance he's never saying i don't have guidance he had guidance he was clear about it he used to say ma indana illa riwayatun an rasulillah yes we have a lot of transmitted knowledge from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam but we don't have anything other than that they're very clear about that in their narrations so mawlana come to the narration where the imams of ahlul bayt say this here this is uh, رجال الكشي مؤسسة الأعلام مي إديشن this is page 165 الإمام الصادق عليه السلام says ما لهم he's speaking about the غلات look at what he says وإن قوما كذبوا عليا he says there is a group of people who are lying against me and who have lied against me ما لهم أذاقهم الله حر الحديد may Allah make them taste the heat of iron فوالله ما نحن إلا عبيد الذي خلقنا واصطفانا. He says we swear by Allah. He's taking an oath in the name of Allah. I swear by Allah. We are nothing. ما نحن إلا. We are nothing except for one thing. What are you, ya Imam? He says we are nothing except for one thing. عبيد الذي خلقنا. We are the slaves of the one who created us. We are slaves. واصطفانا and he chose us he honored us ما نقدر على ضر ولا نفع for those of you asking what does he mean by chose us this is a reference and it's embedded in the Quran in Surah Fatir Allah says ثم أورثنا الكتاب الذين اصطفينا من عبادنا Allah says then we made the, the, those whom we chose of our slaves the inheritors of the book so then Allah goes on to describe that those whom he has chosen to inherit the book are belong to three categories. Of them, they are those who are zalim. Of them, there are those who are muqtasid, they are average. And of them, there are those who are sabiqun bil khairat, who are the first and foremost. So basically Allah is saying that this ummah has been chosen. This entire ummah is chosen to be an inheritor and recipient of Allah's book. So he's referring to that choosing that Allah has mentioned. In Surah Fatir. In any case, the important point here is after saying that we are nothing but the slaves of the one who chose, who created us and chose us. This is the statement of Imam Sadiq He says, We do not have power to cause any harm or any benefit. And he does not add any caveat to say, Well, except with the permission of Allah, except when Allah empowers us. Oh, this is all later theology invented by Ghulat. They say permission, no permission, aslan, we don't have any such thing. We don't have any power to cause harm or benefit. And they're talking about material harm and material benefit. Okay, spiritual benefit they can cause, obviously, by virtue of the guidance that they have been, that they have received. But materially speaking, you know, material benefit and harm is things like, you know, saving you from loss in business, giving you offspring, giving you risk, increasing your sustenance. Solving your material, physical difficulties, curing your illnesses. These are things that the Imam is saying, Allah has not given us anything in this domain. And people become angry with us when we present these kinds of things. Mawlana, this is not my statement from my pocket which I'm presenting. 
This is the statement of Imam. You have a problem with Imam Sadiq Ali Islam? Okay. Discuss, discuss your problem with him on the Day of Judgment when you meet him. But this is the theology he taught us. This is the imamology that he taught us. We do not control any harm or any benefit. And the reason why we authenticate this narration, Mawlana, we don't need Sanad analysis for this narration. This narration is embedded and confirmed by the Quran. The Prophet Rasulullah is asked to say the same thing in the Quran. So there's perfect correspondence and harmony between the theology and uh, prophetology of the Quran and the imamology of the Imams. And then he goes on to say, In Rahimana Fabi Rahmati. See, he says, We are completely helpless slaves before Allah. If He shows us mercy, then that is His mercy, not that we deserved it. It's His mercy. Wa in Adhabana. And if He decides to punish us, Fabi Dhunubina, then it will be because of our sins. So Aslan, you can see they don't even claim asma. They don't even claim sinlessness, even though we must assert for the sake of honesty and historical record that these Imams of Ahlul Bayt, all their contemporaries testify that they were the highest in taqwa, that they were the furthest away from sins. Their character was perfectly pure and pristine. But as a matter of imamology, as a matter of when you are stating fact, he's saying yes. We don't claim for ourselves that we are sinless. We believe that if Allah punishes us, it will be because of our sins. So Aslan, for you to then claim something about them, okay? So what you can say about them is that, yes, they were the highest in taqwa, they were the highest in knowledge, and they stayed away from sins because they were people of taqwa. But to say that they were to completely deny and negate what they affirm for themselves would be imamologically problematic as far as the imamology that the imams are presenting you with. They're showing you that they're not robots or computers, you know, for whom the thought of sin or error is inconceivable. No. With the tawfiq of Allah, they're able to avoid the sins and stay away from them. But it's not like they've been programmed that way or Allah has magically offered them some kind of protection, which is the idea that the ghulat were trying to spread. Ghulat were trying to say that Allah has magically protected them. But what the sources show us is that because they were at a such such a high level of taqwa, they used to protect themselves with the tawfiq of Allah, of course. So in any case, then the Imam goes on to say, Wallah, ma lana ala Allah min hujja. We have no hujja against Allah. You know, the ghulat were promoting the idea that the Imams will have a very strong case against Allah on the Day of Judgment. They will be able to rescue all their lovers on the Day of Judgment. The Imam says this is false. We have never claimed this. We don't have any case with Allah. We don't have any argument before Allah. Wala ma'ana min Allahi bara'a. Nor do we have a check of immunity. Bara'a min an nari. You know, in Dua al iftitah also, in the du'as of Shah Ramadan, you people recite, Wa bara'atan min an nari faktub lana. Yeah, what is the meaning of bara'atan min an nari? Ya Allah, give us and write for us an immunity from the fire of hell. So, yeah, you can ask Allah for this. But the ghulat were promoting the idea that Allah has signed a check of immunity. There's a checkbook of immunity from the punishment of the fire of hell. Allah has signed it and he has handed it over to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Blank check. And the Imams can take the pen and write the names of all of those whom they love and they like. They can write their names and Mawlana straight to Jannah. Imam says, this is false. This is a lie. Wala ma'ana min Allahi bara'a. We do not have any such bara'a from Allah. Allah has not given us any checkbook of, of immunity from the fire of hell. He's saying forget about saving others. We cannot even save ourselves. If Allah decides to punish us, it will be because of our sins. So in rahimana fa bi rahmatihi wa in adhabana fa bi dhunubina wallahi ma lana ala Allahi min hujja wa la ma'ana min Allahi bara'a. And then he says wa inna lamayituna. He says look we are human beings like you. Inna we are going to be dead one day. We're going to die naturally like all other human beings. We are also going to die. وَمَقْبُورُونَ And we'll be placed in our graves. وَمَنْشُورُونَ Then we'll be raised on the day of judgment. وَمَبْعُوثُونَ وَمَوْقُوفُونَ We'll be made to stand before Allah. وَمَسْؤُولُونَ And then we will be questioned by Allah. It's not that we are above hisab and above accountability. We will be questioned by Allah. Why lahum ma lahum la'anahum Allah? Woe unto them. May Allah shower his la'na upon these people who are lying against us. And then he goes on to talk about how he says, I am 
He says, look, He says, look at me. I'm in front of you. My flesh is the flesh of Rasulullah. He's a direct descendant. I am the flesh of Rasulullah. Wajildu Rasulullah, the skin that you see, genetically, it is derived from the skin of Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But despite being so closely connected to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abitu ala firashi khaifan wajilan maru'uban. I sleep on my bed in a state of perpetual fear, in a state of perpetual awe. Khaifan wajila. I, I, I sleep worried. At night, I worry. Ya yeah, Imam, what are you worried about? He says, I'm worried about my hereafter. I have to give hisab for my entire life in front of Allah. I'm worried about that. Ya manuna wa afza. He says, this is what, this is what is so counterintuitive and so astonishing. He says, these ghulat, they sleep peacefully at night. Why? Why do the ghulat sleep peacefully? Same reason why so many people today among the followers of the school of Ahlul Bayt sleep peacefully. Because they think Allah has given blank check, checkbook to Ahlul Bayt, they will save us on the day of judgment. Bibi Fatima will come to save us, so and so will come to save us. Our salvation is guaranteed because we have, we, um, humne jo hai, we, have uh, uh, we have caught on and we have grasped the, the hand of the Ahlul Bayt. So our salvation is secure. The Imam is saying, are you in your right mind? We are worried about our hereafter. I sleep at night. I'm not able to sleep at night because I worry about my hereafter. What? How will Allah do my hisab? What will happen to me? How will I respond to his questions? He says, Ya'manun, but these ghulat, they sleep peacefully because they have وَغَرَّهُمْ فِي دِينِهِمْ You know, just like the Jews. Allah tells you in the Quran, وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا You know, people, human beings have this folly. They love to invent ideas, feel good you know, theologies and philosophies to delude themselves into a feeling of safety and security. So the Jews had deluded themselves into thinking that لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا The fire of hell will not touch us except for a limited number of days. Yani, even if we go to hell, we'll burn there for some time and then we'll come out. Allah says, قُلْ أَتَّخَذْتُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدًا Have you signed a covenant with Allah? A contract that Allah will only put you for a few days and then take you out? أَمْ تَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Or are you making claims about Allah for which you have no knowledge? Iftira. You're lying about Allah. Then Allah says, بَلَا مَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً وَأَحَاطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ فَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِتُونَ Allah says, no, I've got no such policy. Then I'll burn you only for a few days and then I will save you. No, 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 no. بَلَا مَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً Whoever earns evil. And then his evil grows and swells to the point of encompassing him from all sides. And you drown yourself in evil. Allah is not going to send you to hell for small, trivial evil, small, minor mistakes. No. But Allah says if you earn evil and you keep on earning evil and evil, evil, until it encompasses your whole existence. Allah says, and such a person will be among the companions of the fire of hell. Whom fiha khalidun, they shall abide therein. So the Imam says, you know, I am the flesh and blood of Rasulullah and yet I'm so fearful. And then this is the place where he then goes on to uh, declare his disassociation. And he says, Ushidukum an waladani Rasulullah. Again he repeats. He says, Look, I am someone who is a direct descendant of Rasulullah. I don't have any blank check of immunity, even for myself, min Allah, from Allah. In Apa'tuhu Rahimani. Look at my example. Huh? If I obey Allah, He will have mercy on me. I have hope in that. But wa in asaituhu. I am under no illusion. I am under no delusion. If I disobey him, if I defy him, if I go against him, who is saying this? Imam Sadiq Ali Muhammad. He is saying that if I disobey him, 
azabani azaban shadida i have no doubt he will punish me with a terrible and dreadful punishment aw ashadda azab in fact the greatest of punishment because what the amount of knowledge and guidance he has given me the expectations are also very high for me so if i if i mess up if i um end up deviating from the vision of allah my punishment is going to be even greater maulana some more insights i can share if there is time this is i just want to show you that the imams of ahlul bayt alayhi wassalatu wassalam when allah talks about entities in the quran these kufar and mushrikeen of makkah they have taken entities other than allah and allah's biggest issue is that those entities control no benefit or harm you are taking entities who control no benefit or harm and you are taking them as your guardians and protectors and the focus of your attention and your devotion and supplication other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allah says this is something i can never approve of and so if you want further proof that the imams of ahlul bayt considered themselves to be part of these entities who are taken as awliya besides allah even though they control no benefit or harm uh, i want to share with you this book ash-shi'atu wal ghulu this is one of the latest pub- research publications that has emerged from the hawzat from the hawza it's authored by ayatollah ash-shaykh hussein al-khashim who is a very prominent Uh, Shia uh, traditional 12 Rashi Askola from the Hausa and uh, he's a prolific author and great researcher he's written this beautiful book it, it just came out uh, this year in 2022 and these are the latest publications Maulana this book runs it's so thoroughly well researched it runs in around it's a, it's a 591 page book and thoroughly well researched everything he has done here authentications documentation evidence it's beautiful i wish you know may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the other islah admins they're always you know very keen on sharing all the latest books with us i, I did not actually have a copy of this book uh, they are the ones who shipped it to me and i wish that other jamaats and other organizations could could be so prompt in supplying these kinds of latest researches that are coming from the hawzat to our resident ulama because a lot of them are not familiar with the latest researches and what's going on in the hawzat you know they study there for 4 or 5 years they come back they get detached they don't they no longer know what research is going on there well the researches that are coming out of the hawzat you have so this is a very detailed study but i'm just going to mention to you what he says about imam al rida alayhi salam when he's talking about the approaches that the imams of ahlul bayt alayhi musallatu wassalam adopted in their fight against ghulu because he in his study he has concluded that the imams of ahlul bayt alayhi musallatu wassalam declared war on all the ghulat and all kinds of ghulu and so i want you to focus on this ghulu because this narration is talking about the exact ghulu that you will hear support from from the member in your communities in your some of your supplications in some of your amal you will see this kind of ghulu and this kind of ghulu has penetrated and percolated down to the grassroots level such that the people at the level of the street are affected by it but look at what imam al rida alayhi salam is saying and i want to read out this to you he says one of the means that the imams of ahlul bayt adopted in their fight and in their war against the ghulat was to use their supplications and the rhetoric in their supplications to turn people away from the ghulat and to draw attention against the ghulat so he says at dua wa al ghulat the imams prayed against the ghulat they invoked the malediction of allah against the ghulat how he says an example of this is فقد ادخل الامام الرضا عليه السلام قضيه مواجهه الغلاة الى عالم الدعاء this is imam al rida alayhi salam brought his campaign his anti ghulat campaign imam al rida alayhi salam was running an anti ghulat campaign because as 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 we mentioned before in that lecture that imam al sadiq alayhi salam had said what 
فإن فينا أهل البيت في كل خلف عدولا ينفون عنه تحريف الغالي إن شاء الله from our descendants in every generation there will be reformers who will do what who will purge and purify the deen from the dirt and filth and the tahrif and distortion of the ghulat, of the exaggerators. So Imam al-Rida is a direct descendant of Imam al-Sadiq And in his time, this is, these are the measures that he took against the ghulat. So he brought his campaign, he took his campaign against the ghulat and he brought it to the world of his supplications. حيث إنه توجه إلى الله تعالى بالبراءة منهم. So he turned to Allah subhanahu wa taala and disassociated from the ghulat in keeping Allah as his witness. واستنزل عليهم غضبه تعالى and he asked Allah to shower his wrath and his displeasure upon these ghulat. الأمر الذي يشير إلى خطورة الغلو. آيات الله شيخ حسين الخشن says He's a Hausa scholar. Huh? Don't say that, oh, but these are this this is research of people who are not from Hausa and they haven't studied and Maulana, this is someone who has spent his entire life studying the ulum of Al Muhammad. He is saying that this fact that Imam al made dua against the Ghulat, and this particular dua, he used to make it frequently, not that once he made or twice, he may used to make it was part of his routine supplications. Because the menace of the ghulat acquired new proportions in his time. As I will show you inshallah if we get the time in future lectures. So he says the fact that Imam Ar-Rida was so troubled by the ghulat and he was so against them that he actually devoted portions of his dua to, to invoking the ghadab of Allah and the la'na of Allah upon them. It shows you khuturatul ghulu. It shows you the danger of ghulu. وَشِدَّةِ الْمَوْقِفِ مِنْ رُمُوزِهِ And it shows you how stern and how firm the Imams were against it. Now listen to this. He narrates from Shaykh al-Saduq this dua and supplication of Imam al-Rida alayhi salam. Shaykh al-Saduq in Kitab al-I'tiqadat, he does not give the sanad for this. But if you look at the individual faqarat, if you follow the manhaj of Tafqir al-Nas, this entire narration is super authentic. Because every single line in this narration, you can find it find it authenticated in narrations for which we have the sanad and it has been authenticated by the scholars. In any case, look at what Imam al says. He says, Allahumma, and please, my dear brothers and sisters, I want you to think of your aqidah right now. What, what is your imamology? What are your beliefs about the Imams? What have they been teaching you from the mimbar and the madrasa about the Imams? What have you been learning from your society? Present it before this mirror. Do it right now before on the Day of Judgment you have to uh, suffer embarrassment and awkwardness and humiliation that your imamology was different from the imamology of, your, of the imam, the very imam that you claim to follow. Look at what Imam Rada alayhi salam says. He says, Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka min al-hawli wal quwa. He says, Ya Allah, I declare before you my disassociation from all power and might. I am declaring before you that I have no power and no might. Why is he saying this? Because the biggest claim of the ghulat and especially the mufawwidah who had become active by this time is that Allah Azza wa Jal and Imam al rida was presented. If, if you want, we can present to you narrations from Ayun Akbar al rida where the reports are brought to Imam al rida That this is what some of your Shia have started saying about you. That Allah has given you with his permission and due to his hikmah and wisdom, he has given you Imam al rida and your pious forefathers the power to create with his permission and by his delegation. He has given you the power to give rizq and sustenance and distribute it among the creations. He has given you power and authority over amr or tadbirul amr. You can regulate the affairs of the universe with Allah's permission. So you can cause rain, you can you have control over the winds, all of it with Allah's permission. And you know what? Some of these things are not completely impossible if you think logically. If you abandon the texts, 
in in some past instances prophet isa alayhi salam was given certain miraculous powers sulaiman alayhi salam was given miraculous powers but the question is were the imams given these powers because the ghulat are not claiming about so interesting thing is sulaiman allah gave him such amazing supernatural powers today no one supplicates to him even though quranically it is established that he had those powers he was given amazing supernatural powers yet does anyone supplicate to sulaiman saying ya ya sulaiman allah gave you these powers do you see any imam of ahlul bayt supplicating to sulaiman that ya sulaiman allah gave you all of this and by the permission and power of allah i'm asking you no my dear because if allah gives a prophet a miracle doesn't mean that you should then supplicate to that prophet oh, but that miracle was given for a short time to prove a simple point that this person is not speaking on his own authority he's speaking on the authority of allah and proof proof of that is he's showing you an act that no one except allah can perform and allah is allowing that act to be performed at his hands to prove that he's sent by god but that was true for those prophets you can't do qiyas and derive these things for the imams of ahlul bayt and the biggest proof of this in the quran is verse 73 onwards of surah al maida where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebukes and rebuffs the Christians who supplicate to Isa alayhi salam and Maryam salam allahi alayha. They supplicate to her across ghaib. Allah says, قُلْ أَتَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مَا لَا يَمْلِكُ لَكُمْ ضَرًّا وَلَا نَفْعًا وَاللَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ Allah says, O Prophet, tell them, are you going to worship entities besides Allah who control no harm and no benefit? Isa alayhi salam, Allah is telling them, and his mother, they control no harm and no benefit. This is verse 73. Look at the context. Huh? Allah is talking to Christians here, not to Kufar and Mushkin of Makkah. So what is Allah telling in the Quran? What is he telling about Isa? Even though in the same Quran, Allah testifies that during the lifetime of Isa, when he was physically present on this earth, Allah gave him the power to bring the dead back to life with his permission. He gave him the power to heal the blind and to cure the leper with Allah's permission. He gave him these miracles. But these miracles were only valid for so long as he was physically accessible to the people. Now that he has gone back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah elevated him to himself. Now that he is no longer accessible to us, and now that he is separated from us by the curtain of ghaib, now what Allah is saying in verse 73? He's saying, La yamlikum darran wa la nafa'a. Now he no longer controls any harm or any benefit. But Ya Allah, you told us he, can, he had the power to control life and death. He could give life, he could give death. Uh, sorry, he could bring the dead back to life. He could cure the blind. So Baba, all those powers for his prophetic mission. So long as he was preaching on this earth, those powers were given to him. But it doesn't mean that now that Allah has taken him back to himself, that now you continue to say, Ya Isa, Allah gave you all these powers, so please listen to my supplications. Allah says, no. The verse of Surah Al-Isra that we presented in the previous lecture, Allah rebuffs, he denies this. Verses 56 and 57, when uh, the Mufassirin have mentioned that this is about Isa alayhi salam. Allah is saying for Isa that, لا يملكون كشف الضر عنكم ولا تحويلا. He doesn't mention Isa by name. Because if he mentioned him by name, he would say, okay, that only Isa is not allowed to call upon. Allah is saying, no, قُلِدُ Call upon all those or any of those whom you claim can respond to supplications apart from me. Any of them. So, Isa comes under this. Musa alayhi salam comes under this. Alayhi salatu wa salam jami'an. Our Prophet comes under this. Imams of Ahlul Bayt, the Sufi saints, the righteous, pious souls. All of them come under this. So long as they are in this world, they have limited capacity to cause benefit and harm. But after they go back to Allah, Allah retains, Allah is the only one who retains power to cause us benefit and harm from across the curtain of ghaib. In any case, verse 73 of Surah Al-Ma'idah makes it very clear that in the eyes of Allah, after entities like Isa alayhi salam go across the curtain of ghaib, they go beyond the curtain of ghaib, they no longer can harm us or benefit us in the least. And Imam al-Rida even when he was alive, he was saying the same thing about himself. Look at his dua, listen to it carefully, and I will end with it. Inshallah, zahmat tamam. The Imam says, Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka min al-hawli wal quwa. He says, Ya Allah, I completely detach myself and disassociate myself in your presence before you and calling you as my witness from all power and might. I deny power and might. Why? 
Because the ghulat are claiming that Allah has empowered him. He says, Ya Allah, I deny that I'm empowered. All power, all hawl and quwa, I detach and distance and disassociate myself, extract myself from it. Why? He says, فَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِكَ because there is no hawl and no quwa, no power and no might except with you. He says, Allahumma, listen to this, my dear brothers and sisters, and please share this, this advisory and these words of Imam Ruda with your loved ones. We don't want, we sincerely don't want our community members, our brothers and our sisters, people we love to come under these harsh words that you're going to hear from Imam Ruda And this is an Imam whose dua is mustajab. He says, Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka min alladheena da'aw lana ma laysa lana bihaq. He says, O oh Allah, I disassociate myself from all those who claim about us, idda'aw, who claim about us, ma laysa lana bihaq. What is not true about us? All the claims of the ghulat come under this. Because the very definition of ghulu is الَّذِينَ يَقُلُونَ فِينَا مَا لَا نَقُلُهُ فِينَا فِي أَنفُسِنَا The ghulu is to say things about the Imams of Ahlul Bayt which they do not say about themselves. They never claimed rububiyyah. They never claimed the rububiyyah the sifat of Allah. They never claimed that we give sustenance with Allah's permission. They never claimed that we answer supplications with Allah's permission. They never claimed that we are a masoom. They never claimed that we are this, we are that. All of these claims that have been popularized they are bati, they are not haq. And that's why the Imam is disassociating from all those who claim this about them. Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka min alladheena da'aw lana ma laysa lana bi haq. We disassociate ourselves from all those who claim that about us, which is not haq. Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka min alladheena qalu fina ma lam naqulhu fi anfusina. Now he comes to... He uses the very phrase that Imams used to define ghulu. He says, Ya Allah, I disassociate myself in front of you from all of those who say things about us and who claim things for us which we have not claimed for ourselves. Allahumma lakal khalqu wa minkal amr. He says, Ya Allah, creation belongs to you and the regulation of the affairs of the universe is your exclusive domain. No wilaya taqwiniya, my dear. Allah has given no such wilaya over the universe to anyone like Imam al-Rada or any of his pious, noble ancestors or forefathers. He says, Allahumma lakal khalq. Creation is yours. Wal minkal amr. Amr is all coming from you. Wa iya kana abud. Wa iya kana sta'in. Only you do we worship. Only you do we seek assistance and help from across the curtain of ghaib. Allahumma anta khaliquna. O oh Allah, we testify that you are our creator. Wa khaliqu abainal awwaleen. Wa abainal akhireen. You are the creator of our earliest ancestors. Our forefathers of old. And you are the Lord and the creator of the later forefathers of ours. Allahumma, listen to this. This is now coming to our discussion. Allahumma la taliqu rububiyyatu. Illa bik. He says, Ya Allah, I testify that rububiyya, the quality of being a rub. And I want you to understand and remember our lecture yesterday where we talked about qualities of rububiyya and functions of rububiyya. What are the functions in the Quran that Allah associates with rububiyya? وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ your, your Rabb said, call upon me, make dua to me across ghaib, I will answer. I can hear you wherever you are. Across ghaib, I can hear you. So, Receiving du'as is a function of rububiyyah. Controlling the heavens and the earth and governing the whole universe, wilayah taqwiniyah, is a function of rububiyyah. Sending the rain, the winds, causing things to grow from the earth, giving life, giving death, controlling the power of sight and hearing, giving rizq, sustenance to the creations, all of these are functions of rububiyyah. Giving protection. How ironic that this is the same imam for whom they have popularized the concept of Imam Dami. That Eti, when you travel, you are under zamanat of Imam. Look at what Imam is saying. Zamanat of Imam, Allah in the Quran challenges. He says, قُلْ مَنْ يَكْلَأُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَنِ مِنْ دُونِ الرَّحْمَنِ أو مِنَ الرَّحْمَنِ Who protects you on night and day when you're traveling, when you're going here and there? Who protects you? Allah says, it is me. 
And these people are saying, no, yeah, but with Allah's permission, the zamanat will come from the Sparrow. Look at what Imam Rada is saying. Allahumma la taliqur rububiyyah to illa bik. He says, Ya Allah, I testify that rububiyyah, okay, the quality of being rub, and all the functions that are associated with rububiyyah, la taliqur rububiyyah to illa bik. I testify that rububiyyah and everything associated with it does not befit, does not behoove any entity other than you. Rububiyyah is only for Allah and all the functions associated with Rububiyyah which the Hulat are trying to give us huh? because Imam Sadiq what did he testify? They want to give Rububiyyah the qualities of Allah's Rububiyyah to the Ibad the slaves of Allah so that if Allah is the recipient of Du'as they want to say that Imams are recipient of Du'as they can listen to your supplications and either respond to them themselves or they can forward them to Allah where, and Allah will respond Whereas Allah doesn't teach you any of this. Udu'uni, call upon me directly. You don't need any intermediaries. Imam Ali confirms this in the wasiyah to Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. When he says, وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ حِجَابًا وَلَا تُرْجُمَانًا Allah has not placed any curtain, any barrier, any veil between you and him so that you should require any intermediaries. And he explicitly says, وَلَمْ يُلْجِئْكَ إِلَى مَنْ يَسْتَشْفِعُ لَكَ إِلَيْهِ Allah has not required you to bring anyone to intercede for you in order to receive what you want from him. Without any intermediaries, without any mediators, he's prepared to listen to you because he's your creator, he's your rub, he's your nurturer, he's your cherisher, he's the one who creates you. Allah says, he's the one who fashions you and shapes you in the wombs of your mother. From that moment, and in fact beyond that moment, he is constantly taking care of you. He is the one doing your tarbiyah. He is the one who is bringing you up. He is the one sustaining you. He is the one providing you with rizq. He is your Lord and Savior and your guardian and your protector. He is your everything. And Imam Rada is saying this is rububiyyah and this rububiyyah does not befit anyone except you, Ya Allah. I am testifying, Imam is saying. وَلَا تَصْلُحُ الْإِلَهِيَةُ إِلَّا لَكْ and as far as ilahiyah is concerned, divinity is concerned, it does not befit anyone except for you, Ya Allah. Now look at what he says. He says, فَلْعَنِ النَّصَارَى الَّذِينَ صَغَّرُوا عَظَمَتَكِ He says, oh, Ya Allah, I ask you to send your la'na on all of the nasara and all of those Christians who diminished your greatness. How? By replacing you with Isa alayhi salam. You see, not all Christians are worthy of blame. A lot of Christians were ignorant. Imam is not talking about them. He is talking about those ghulat of the Christians who resulted in Christianity deviating from the path of Isa Islam. Aslan, how did Christianity become Christianity? Because in the Quran, Allah tells you when the Hawariyin spoke to Isa salam and they pledged support to him, they said, Washhad bi anna bi anna muslimun. They testified, the disciples of Isa alayhi salam testified that they were Muslimun, that they were Muslims, that they were people who submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they were Muslim. Then where did Christians and Christianity come from? Ah, there was Ghulu. There was a Ghulu movement in early Christianity that took is that that replaced Islam. Because Allah is showing you in the Quran, this is an authentic historical document. It's Allah's speech. And He's telling you that the disciples of Isa alayhi salam were all Muslims. This, they said, Ya Allah, bear witness. Washhad bi annana muslimun. Ya Allah, testify, bear witness that we are saying we are Muslims. So the companions and immediate followers of Isa alayhi salam are all Muslims. So our Christianity kya thi ayu? From where did, this, where did they become Christians? Ah, because Islam was Allah focused. Christianity, as the very name suggests, is Christ centric. It's all focused on Christ. Allah has been replaced with the Christ. So Imam al-Ruda is invoking the malediction on the ghulat of the Christians. Before starting with his ghulat, he's saying, no, no, these ghulat are copycats. They're copying the example of those ghulat. So he starts with the source. He says, Ya Allah, send your malediction and send your la'na upon those Christians who diminished your greatness. And he says, Ya Allah, from all of your creations, all those who copy and imitate those ghulat of the Christians, send your lana on them as well. Allahumma inna abiduk. He says, Oh Allah, we are your slaves. Wa abna'u abidik. 
We are the sons of your slaves. لا نملك لأنفسنا ضرا ولا نفعا. Ah. So you can see when the Quran mentions this phrase, it not only applies to idols and other inanimate objects that are worshipped by people besides Allah. Rather, it applies to even entities like prophets and imams of Ahlul Bayt. Prophet in the Quran, imam in his hadith, in his dua. He's saying, Ya Allah, we are slaves and the children of your slaves. We do not control for ourselves. Forget about others, huh? you and me and other. No. Imam says, for myself, for ourselves, we imams do not control any harm or any benefit. Wala mawtan, wala hayatan, wala nushura. Ya Allah, I testify that we don't control any harm, any benefit. We don't control death. We don't control life. We don't control resurrection. And this line is actually taken from Taqibat Amirul Mu'minin. Even you recite it after Dua Taqibat Ma. Then you recite that La Yamliku Li Nafsihi Nafan Wala Darran Wala Mautan Wala Hayatan Wala Shuraya Taqibat from Sahifa Alawiya from Ali Alayhi Salam. This is a part of the du'as that the Imams used to testify that yes, Ya Allah, we have never claimed that we control, uh, you know, benefit or harm or maut or hayat or mushur. And then look at what he says after that. Allahumma man za'ama annana arbabun. Ya Allah, whoever claims that we are arbab, that we are sustainers, we control risk, we control creation, we grant offspring, we listen to supplications. Any of the functions of rububiyya, anyone who claims this for us, whether he says with his mouth or not, doesn't matter. Actions speak louder than words. If you are directing things to the imams that only deserve to be directed to Allah, you are treating them as arbab. And the Quran shows you that whether you consider somebody an Arab or Arbab, doesn't, Allah doesn't go by what you say with your mouth. He goes by your actions. He accuses the Jews and Christians of taking their scholars as Arbab. So do you know of any Jew or Christian in history who ever referred to his scholar as Rab, as, as the sustainer? No. But they treated them. They gave them a haq. One of the hukuk of Allah is that he deserves to be obeyed unconditionally. And they gave this they gave away this haq and they shared it with, the, with their scholars. So Allah accused them of making arbab out of their scholars. Same thing with other rububiyati functions, like Allah answering prayers or coming to our assistance in times of needs, yani sending assistance or harming us or benefit, benefiting us from across the curtain of ghayb. These are all functions of rububiyya. So the Imam says, Allahumma man za'ma annana arbabun Ya Allah, whoever claims that we are Arbab, we are sustainers. Ya Allah, then we declare our disassociation from such a person before you. He says, Ya Allah, anyone who claims that we are, that the, the job of creation that you have given us the power to create or that you have placed upon us, you have delegated upon us the task of distributing the sustenance for the human beings. Then we declare our disassociation and we declare our innocence before you, Ya Allah, from all such claims, exactly exactly as Isa disassociated from those gulat of the Christians who are attributing similar rububiyati sifat to him, he disassociated from them. Ya Allah, we follow his footsteps. We, in like manner, disassociate ourselves and distance ourselves and declare our innocence before you from all those who have claimed similar things about us. Allahumma inna lam nad'uhum ila ma yaz'umun. He says, Ya Allah, we never called them or invited them to make claims like this about us. So then he begs Allah, he says, Fala tu akhidna bima yaqulun. He says, Ya Allah, please do not take us to task. Do not hold us accountable for their claims. Because Ya Allah, we have completed the hujjah. We have distanced and disassociated publicly from all such people. And in front of you, Ya Allah, you are the best witness. We are calling you as our witness. That we disassociate from such people. So Ya Allah, please... Please don't take us to task for what they have claimed. And Ya Allah, forgive us. We feel ashamed and humiliated and embarrassed that such blasphemous claims have been made about us. 
that you are the one who controls the universe and responds to the prayers and controls the risk and controls creation. These are your exclusive attributes. And these fools and insane people have taken these sifat and they have attributed to us. In your blessed and holy name. Ya Allah, this is very embarrassing for us. Please forgive us. Even though it's not his fault, but he's saying, Ya Allah, we feel ashamed and humiliated as a result. So please forgive us. And then he goes on to pray against them and invoke the maledictions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against them. So my dear brothers and sisters, I apologize if I take if I took more time uh, than was ideal. But our main goal and our main focus is to inform all our all our people that please the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have disassociated from all those who attribute Rububiyyah to them. So let us, if until now, in your aqidah, in your belief, in your practice, in anything, you were either considering the Imam to have Rububiyyati, Sifat, or powers, or your actions were manifesting that. Instead of turning to Allah and making Him the focus of all your slavery and your devotion and your worship and your supplication, if you were making the Imam your focus, then you need to know that the Imam has disassociated from this, he has distanced himself from this, and he has also invoked the La'na of Allah. So before this La'na reaches us, and before the Imam reiterates this disasso disassociation on the Day of Judgment, let us also, following his noble footsteps, disassociate ourselves from all of this. And let us declare our innocence before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from all of this. Let us purge our aqidah and reform our aqidah from all these blasphemous claims, particularly al wilayat taqwiniya, which the Imam has roundly refuted in this dua of his. He says, anyone who claims that Allah has given us authority over creation, over sustenance, over this, over that, anyone who claims this, Ya Allah, we disassociate. So my dear brothers and sisters, all those who are promoting wilayat taqwiniya from the mimbar, you say, Mawlana, but so and so scholar, but Ayatullah this, but Ayatullah that. Mawlana, you want to follow the Ayatullah, Wallah, you want to follow Imam Rida alayhi salam. Choice is yours. And there are Ayatullahs, by the way, who are authenticating this dua from Imam Rida and citing it as a, an example of the kind of warfare that the Imams launched against uh, the Ghulat and the Mufawwidah. May the la'na of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon them in perpetuity. And that's why if you go again to the incident of Karbala, you will see that on the day of Ashura, and as Imam al Hussein salam stood on the plains of Karbala, and as he was lecturing the army of Yazid, one of the statements that he declares, one of the ayat of the Quran that he presents before them, he says, Look, I am not afraid of your numbers, and I'm not afraid of what you're going to do to me. Do you know why? Because in fact, he challenges them. He says, I want you to assemble all your might and all your power. And then plot against me and make strategies against me and don't give me any respite. These are ayat of Quran he's reciting. Huh? Why? Why am I so fearless? Why am I so brave in the face of such overwhelming numbers? He says, Inna my wali, my guardian, my protector is Allah who revealed the book and he befriends the righteous. This ayah is the ayah our Imam, our beloved Imam Abu Abdullah took refuge in and this is the ayah he recited in front of the enemies. And this is the ayah that he based his confidence in, the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq, to realign ourselves with this wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to protect us from being deceived by the false wilayas that the ghulat tried to invent and that they tried to artificially give to the imams of Ahlul Bayt. Alayhim afdal salati wa salam. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك